If you put in the seat of a prophet sallallahu you would find one particular moment in his life which kind of speaks to the tragedy of the people of Gaza, especially, not just the Palestinians, but especially Gaza. In the sixth year of his mission, after he declared himself the messenger of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ was beginning to have great success. He was able to send permission to Abyssinia, and so it was very clear that Muslims would survive because there was already another community in Abyssinia which would survive if the community, God forbid, uh, was attacked or eliminated in Mecca. But not only that, some of the stalwarts of Mecca, such as Prophet Sallallahu uncle Hamza and Ibn Qattab, may God be pleased, and both of them had converted to Islam. And people were willing to listen to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even though traders and people who were coming to Mecca, they had already heard of this message of one God. And they were asking for the Prophet Sallallahu it kind of upset the social order and the political order of Mecca. <coughs> and in order to put an end to this social, political, cultural, and religious uprising, they got together and they decided to boycott the two families of Banu Hashim and Banu Mutal. They came together, they actually put it down in paper, they wrote down a treaty. And some of the articles of the boycott was that number one, nobody will marry, give their daughters, or take the daughters from those two tribes. Nobody will trade with them. Nobody will talk to them. Nobody will wish with them. Nobody will visit with them. A complete boycott. And that boycott created such an environment that Abu Talib actually feared for the life of Prophet and his companions. So he took his families, except Abu Lahab, and moved into a tiny valley called Sheikh Abu Talib. It's like a small ravine where they could all live together and protect themselves from these external attacks. And they lived there for three years. And if the historians of Islam and Sira have not dwelt much on this particular three years of life, so if you read the Sira, of Ibn Hisham, you find there are only five or six pages of discussions of this because the suffering of Prophet Sallallahu his family and his companions and those who may not have actually been Muslims but were associated with the tribe who were also bicorded was so severe that out of the desire to maintain the dignity of Prophet Sallallahu they did not describe in detail. But some commentators still say that the people of Mecca at night would hear the children in the ship of Abu Talib crying with hunger. The, the voice of children crying at night for hunger would travel across. There was no shelter, there was no oasis. The rocks of Mecca become as hot as 60, 70 degrees centigrade in that heat when they were reflecting. Now, this is the suffering of the Prophet and his companions for three full years. But what is interesting about it is that ultimately the cries of those children, the hunger, the pain, reach the hearts of even those who were doing zulm upon them. Even their oppressors were moved. Now, people like Abu Jahl and Abu Dhahab had formed together a coalition by which they made sure that the boycott was kept in place. They had kept the treaty with everybody's signature in the middle of the Kaaba, inside the Kaaba, and they used that to tell everybody, we have all agreed upon this sanction. It is with no sunset laws, in the sense there was no end to the sanctions. So this powerful coalition of Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, and some of his friends forced everybody to stay in line. And there are many such episodes that people moved by the tragedy would smuggle food in, would trade, traders would, would sometimes manage to bring something in for the Prophet, especially during the months, uh, the holy months, there was some relaxation of these sanctions. But one thing interesting happened, that at one point, one of the members of the coalition from Mecca decided it was unbearable. He said, this is not what we had agreed upon. What we had agreed upon was to put so much pressure on Prophet 
and his companions at island, he would stop preaching or they would stop following him. That was the purpose. Our purpose was not to starve them to death. Our purpose was not to make such great suffering. And this was an any interesting period. There was a lot of dialogue between the two sides in spite of the sanctions. There was a lot of cursing of each other. The surah about Abu Lahab, Abi Lahab, was revealed during this period. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was identifying the perpetrators by name or description and telling them that they will be punished on the day of judgment for making the Prophet and his followers suffer so much. But one day, one of this, and I don't remember whether it was Abu Lahab or Abu Jahl, met the Prophet sallallahu and told him that you should stop cursing us and our gods. Because if you do, then we will also curse your God. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Muslims, not just the Muslims in that valley, to never insult the religious symbols of other people unless they insult the religious symbols of our deen, which means the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there was this dialogue taking place. So one day, one of the members of the coalition who realized that the pain was severe went around and found three and four more people who were of his point of view. And they felt that we had gone too far. So one of them said, I will dare to speak in front of everybody and say, we have gone too far. Will you back me? And so when they all collected in Mecca, this man stood up and said, we have gone too far. They are suffering too much. We have to put an end to this. And then when the other four people stood up and spoke with him, it was an interesting thing. They suddenly realized that the coalition of the oppressors was in minority. Most of the people of Mecca were feeling guilty and were against the sanctions, but were afraid to speak up. So the moment, the moment this coalition of five people spoke up, everybody said, yes, we need to put an end to this. So they walked in to the Kaaba to tear the treaty, and they found that, of course, that treaty was eaten up by termites. And only the beginning of the treaty was left, which was Bismillah. Even the Quraysh used to start their writing with Bismillah. And everything else was written by termites, and so the treaty ended, and that ended the sanctions. Now why am I, at this moment, re recalling the text? Because in this moment, when we look at Gaza, when we look at Syria, when we look at Iraq, and we see this pain, the pain will cloud our judgments. The pain will cloud our judgments. We get more emotional. And instead of fighting injustice, we incline towards injustice. Instead of condemning oppression, we become oppressive in the manner in which we condemn oppression. And that is not the way to go. There are two important lessons to learn from that period of life. One is the ethics of change or minhaj, or the methodology for change, which the non-Muslims of Mecca adopted to end the sanctions. They came together, formed the coalition, because if one person had spoken, Abu Jahl and his people would definitely have attacked that person. But they formed a critical coalition to speak up for justice. Indeed, one of the greatest forms of jihad is to speak the truth to power. And these five had got together to decide and tell the people of Mecca that enough is enough. And they did it peacefully. And they did it in a public forum through a town hall meeting. And they <coughs> put an end to the legal basis. They put an end to the legal basis of the sanctions and the boycott. They didn't just break it illegally. They ended the legal basis for the sanctions. That is the beauty of the change that they made. But what do we learn from Prophet Sallallahu and his companions who went into the sun? As I was reading about it, I said, this is so amazing. There is no such thing in philosophy as ethics of suffering. We assume that if you suffer injustice, it gives you the license to do whatever you wish. But the Prophet Sallallahu demonstrated in those three years that there is an ethics on how to be a victim. If you want to know what is the ethical way of being a victim, how to conduct yourself in extreme oppression, then read the stories, the few that we have 
but the Prophet and his companions when they were boycotted and they were living in that land. Number one, they remained steadfast. They did not waver in their purpose. They did not waver in their belief. Nobody raised the question, if there is a true God, why are we suffering? They believed that there is a God and they understood that there is a purpose behind us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to. The Prophet sallallahu never diluted his message. <coughs> and he never stopped preaching his message. Even during the period when the, the sanctions were a bit relaxed during the holy months and when traders were allowed to interact with them, he spent more time giving his message than trading. So that is the second most important thing that we should learn is that there is an ethic to suffer. We we'll take pause and let's ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness for our sins and forgiveness for the sins of our brothers and sisters, especially in the areas where there is so much suffering that the suffering may compel them to move away from an ethical position. Alhamdulillah. There are some ahadiths that I want to share with you. And these are so incredible, it's unbelievable. One of the, the beauties of Islamic tradition is that it comes with theory and practice load. So you can read the Quran and understand the theory, and then you read about the hadith and the tradition of Sunnah, and you see the practice. So you can look at the principle and you can see how the principle has been implemented in practice. And if you reflect on them, it can be uplifted. It's unbelievable. For example, uh, let me read this to you. I'm sure a lot of you know about this famous hadith about when the Prophet ﷺ made Mu'ad ibn Jabal, the governor of Yemen, and sent him there. And so it became the source of the hadith for Ishtihad. But he said something else which is often forgotten. Besides saying that if, how will you judge between people? And he responded by saying, I will first go to the Quran. If there is no Quran uh, directly addressing the issue, then I will look at the Sunnah. And if I can't find direct from there, then I will use my reason, which is the reason why Imam Shafi in his Risala goes on to justify the theory of Ishtihad. But he also said something interesting. The Prophet warned Muad. He said, be afraid from the curse of the oppressed there is no screen between his invocation and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very profound comment and it should make you cry from inside if you hear what this means. You know, for those of us who believe that in his journey on Miraj, the Prophet came very close to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But even then, they say that there were 70 barriers of light and dark between the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, screens of lightness and darkness. But when someone who is oppressed is suffering, and some injustice is done to somebody, and they cry out in pain, there is no screen between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no partition. They are with Allah at that time. So when people suffer, it brings them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> never, never be the target of their curse. Never be the target of their curse. Never ignore their pain. When we watch these scenes on Facebook and YouTube of what is happening in Gaza, and we see that, we, we feel that how can we ignore the agony of this? Today, I got an email from Brother Murad Kose that there were 6,000 people who prayed the Salat al Eid, but only 150 people showed up for the protest in Gaza last week. There is a protest today, too. They're trying to speak truth to power. The protest is outside the office of Chris Coons, who is as much our representative as he is anybody else's representative in Dalaman. I would love to see more of you go there and let him know that he is not speaking for all the Americans when he says he stands with the oppressor. We don't want him to change 
things. He cannot do that. But at least one acknowledgement that there are children who are dying who do not deserve to die. You know, when people hear about condemnation of terrorism, they are saying, there is no justification for killing civilians. But now the same people can turn around and find justification for killing children when there is absolutely no justification for killing civilians. How can there be justification for killing children no matter what? And it is in this context that I want to invoke two or three more ahadith from Professor Lansar. He said, help your brother when he's an oppressor or when he is oppressed. And his companion said, should we even help the oppressor? And the Prophet said, yes, the way you help an oppressor is by preventing him from oppressing. And the prevention needs not be just physical. It can be through education. What we learn from Mecca is that even among those who oppress you, there is humanity and we need to appeal to the humanity of the oppressor. We need to incite and invoke and awaken the, the flame of compassion in their hearts so instead of being your enemies, they become your friends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that always respond to evil with good so that your enemy will also become your friend. In a little slightly extended hadith, the Prophet says, a Muslim is a brother of another Muslim, so he should not oppress him, nor should he hand him over to an oppressor. I hope people in Egypt are listening to this. A Muslim is a brother of another Muslim, so he should not oppress him, nor should he hand him over to an oppressor. So you do not support those who are oppressing your brothers. Whoever fulfills the needs of his brother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill his needs. Whoever brought his brother out of discomfort, Allah will bring him out of discomfort on the day of judgment. And whoever screened a Muslim from pain, from oppression, from suffering, Allah will screen him on the day of judgment. It is a deal. And the beauty of this whole thing is that that when you stand up for the people of Gaza, when you fight for the refugees of Syria, when you fight for those who are in the mountains today in Iraq who may not be alive tomorrow, when you stand up for them, it is also a selfish thing to do because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you many times more for that same act. One Indian scholar from Nanuddin Awiya said something very beautiful. He said, when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you do ibadah, when you fast, when you pray, when you pray tahajjud, you're up all night reciting the Quran, only you benefit from it. Allah doesn't need our ibadah. He doesn't need anything from us. Before we pray and after we pray, he is the same. But we need that ibadah. So when we do a lot of excessive ibadah, only we benefit. But when we do khidmat al or when we serve the humanity, when we go and do good things for other people, other people benefit and we benefit. So in many ways, your social activism, your political activism, your standing up for justice, your speaking up for truth is far more superior to ibadah because you will get the same benefits of ibadah. But your activism might also relieve the pain and suffering of some other people. And, and finally, I want to read you what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has to say. He says, this is a very interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what is preventing you from standing up for those who are suppressed? What is preventing you from fighting for those who are oppressed and who are suffering from among the men, from among the women, from among the children? Those people who are saying, oh Allah, rescue us from this city whose people oppress us. I mean, how much more directly does it 
need to speak to this situation that we are seeing. When I look at this ayah and I think, my God, this is in Surah Nisa. Go back and read it and reflect it. Ayah number 75 in Surah Nisa. It's as if it has been written for Gaza 2014. They are saying, why cannot you stand up for these people who are pleading to rescue us from this city of oppressors? Please send us from among yourself someone who will be our wali, our protector, our guide. That is the message addressed to the Muslim world. And the second part is, please from among yourselves, send us someone who will help us. That is addressed to us. As American Muslims, we are not in a position to be a protectorate of anybody. We are lucky if we can protect ourselves. But we can be helpers. We can help their cause. And that is something very, very important. There are two things that I want to share with you, and so I've taken more time than I should. There is this protest that is being planned today outside Christmas office from 3.30 to 5.30. If you are in the area, please go visit. On Monday, uh, from 6 o'clock to 8 p.m., we have a panel discussion here uh, at Tarbiya School. From 6 to 8 p.m., we have a panel of speakers coming from Philadelphia, from Washington, D.C. Uh, one of them is the founder of CARE National. He is himself a Palestinian who has seen what happens there many times over. He's a Palestinian refugee. We also have members of the Jewish community who are coming here to speak up on behalf of the Palestinians. There are people who are speaking up for justice. There, are, there is now an organization called Delaware Churches Against Occupation. So there is a coalition of Christian churches who are against the occupation of Palestine and Gaza, who are for the freedom of Palestine, who are for boycott of Israel. And so please come and attend. Speak your mind. Tell us what you want us to do. Empower this coalition. Just as it happened in Mecca, let's go back and tear apart this treaty. That is important. Please do not underestimate the power of people. The power of people is more than the power of weapons and more than any other weapons. You know, every every khutbah, practically that I have heard all my life, ends with this ayah, which which I will also end my khutbah with. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ya'amudu bil adli wal ihsan wa ikhaz al-qurba wa yanha al-fresha wa al-munqa wa al-baqi. But what is interesting is we will reflect on it. The first part I want you to reflect before we start praying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to conduct all our affairs with justice and beauty. Justice is not enough. It is very clear. I mean, this ayah we hear every Jummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us not just to do justice, but do it in a best possible way. Don't ever forget the second part. He is saying the goal is justice, the method is the hasan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he loves beauty. And there's one interesting Hadith al-Qudsi that I read recently and I want to end my khutbah with that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed he loves every heart that is suffering. Every heart that is suffering, Allah loves them. Jazakallah khair wa khumisullah.
واعتذروا تراس ويرحمكم الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا قد كان لكم في رسول الله إسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر ولما رأى المؤمنون الأحزاب قالوا ولما من 
المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا ليجزي الله الصادقين بصدقهم ويعذب المنافقين ويعذب المنافقين إن شاء ويتوب عليهم إن الله كان غفورا رحيما الله Thank you. 